Um, thank you, Sven, for the invitation. And I'm actually uh, very pleased with the timing of my talk as well, because you have been introduced to C. elegans yesterday and in the last cell, and you have been introduced to metformin as well. So it will allow me to uh, move a little faster through the introduction. So I will talk to you about a project we did in the lab uh, on feeding metformin to worms and then figuring out what it does with the worms and how that works. Um, so I'll first give a short introduction. I will be talking about the mitochondria. I'll give a little bit of explanation about that as well. And then um, about what metformin is doing in these worms. Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here when I say aging research is important and we want to um, ensure healthy aging. Um, the research we have been doing in that field uh, was all done on the nematode C. elegans, so a small worm, and we have been collaborating intensively with the lab of Bart Braakman, who you can see over there, who's at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And nearly all the work you will see in my presentation has been done by Wouter de Haas, who is also in the audience, so you can ask uh, him about it later on. Uh, in worms, as well as in many other organisms, we can intervene with lifespan uh, at the genetic level and at the environmental level, and the best way knowing to intervene at the uh, environmental level is dietary restriction. And because we can do this, there is some sort of interest in pharmaceutical intervention in these processes, because they're regulated processes. And the pharmaceutical intervention we were looking at is uh, giving metformin to organisms. So the reason why we are interested in this compound is, you can see it here, it's a bicuanide compound and it's based on um, bicuanides that uh, are extracted from this plant called goat's root. And um, already in medieval times, people used extracts from this plant to treat type 2 diabetes. So it's a very well-known principle. A lot of um, compounds within this bicuanide class have been produced in uh, mainly in the 20th century. And the three most famous ones are named for their side change. All of the sides chains, sorry, are buformin, fenformin, and metformin. And <coughs> buformin and fenformin have been taken away from the market due to uh, major side effects. Uh, metformin still has a few of these side effects, but the occurrence is far um, less prevalent, so uh, it's still on the market. And it's the major drug used to treat type 2 diabetes. And in these studies, uh, what people would see is if you uh, give metformin to these patients, these patients are actually healthier, they have less occurrence of uh, certain types of cancers, they have less occurrence of uh, cardiovascular diseases, and if you feed it to worms and to mice, these uh, animals will actually live longer. So uh, people were starting to think that it might actually be a general health promoting compound. The problem is because it's been there for so long, we don't really know how it works. Um, so that is, uh, that is the interest of our lab. So we want to figure out how this compound is working and what, is it, what it is doing to promote um, lifespan and possibly as well health span. Uh, maybe on a side note, it's been given to Drosophila as well and it does not work in Drosophila. We don't really know why that is. Uh, and I think the main reason why that is, is that nobody bothers looking at something that doesn't work. So, um, and we didn't know how it was working at the time as well. So it doesn't work for all organisms. What we did, and what you can see here, is so if you feed metformin, which is a dashed line, to worms, you see about a 20% increase in lifespan. Um, and what we did is we took samples uh, from worms treated and non-treated early in life, day two of adulthood of these worms, and we wanted to find markers there that would help us predict whether they would be healthy later in life, so we could um, see it early on. We extracted proteins and we did gel-based proteomics. So what you do is you label the proteins, you separate them out on a gel, they will migrate to specific spots based on their pi and molecular weight, and everything that's differentially labeled would be something that is of interest. You extract it, you put it in a mass spec, and you identify all these proteins. Out of this experiment, we got 134 differential proteins, and uh, overall, if we looked at them, they would mostly be in, ha have something to do with the mitochondria mitochondria and we could also see a significant increase in catabolic reactions. <clears throat> so our interest after that was focused on the mito mitochondria and a little bit on uh, catabolism as well. Um, mitochondria are known uh, to be able to, so if you intervene with the mitochondria you can extend the lifespan and there's two main routes that can be taken to do that. The first one is the mitochondrial unfolded protein response. So like any, uh, like some of the other organelles, you would have the same in the mitochondria. If there is 
stress on protein folding, if there's stress on the mitonuclear imbalance, if there's some sort of um, structural stress on the proteins, the mitochondria will initiate an unfolded protein response and in some cases this will lead to lifespan extension and in other cases it will not. Um, there's only very recent data showing that it does not always correlate with lifespan extension and we don't really know when it does and when it does not, but it would be one of the possible mechanisms to extend lifespan. The other mechanism is uh, based on a principle called hormesis and uh, it's best sort of explained by what Nietzsche would say, if it doesn't kill you it will make you stronger. So what you can see is if you give very low doses of toxic compounds to organisms they will actually show beneficial effects from receiving these low doses, whereas the compounds are toxic to the organisms. In the mitochondria, these toxic compounds would be reactive oxygen species, they're producing them themselves, but they're toxic to our macromolecules. And so what you would see in cellular toxicity is if you go down and you have very low doses of these ROS, the cells are actually healthier. Uh, and this was first described by in the lab of Michael Risto for the mitochondria. So we wanted to verify whether metformin was acting on one of these two processes, or both of them. And the first thing we checked was a mitochondrial unfolded protein response. I'll quickly go through this because it's not involved. So what you can see here is it's, it's a marker for upregulation of the unfolded protein response. It's a heat shock protein. Uh, in the controls you can see that they light up like Christmas trees, whereas the negative controls in metformin worms do not show an upregulation of this marker. We tested this on different days of adulthood and different concentrations of metformin. It never um, gets upregulated, so you really don't see it. The other reason why we think it's not involved at all is um, there is a time window in which upregulation of an uh, unfolded protein response in the mitochondria is important for lifespan extension, and that's the larval uh, time window. So if you look at the black bars again, this would be wild types, wild types with metformin, this would be larval exposure to metformin only, and it does not extend lifespan, whereas if we use the time window in early adulthood, it will work. So the worms do not need to be exposed to metformin throughout their entire lives. There's a small window through young adulthood that would be sufficient for them to actually have this lifespan extending effect. The other mechanism, as I told you, is hormesis in the mitochondria. And to better understand what we did, I will quickly walk you through this. Um, this is something you might have seen at university and then forgotten. So the mitochondria uh, generate energy, and the way this hormetic response works is um, best described or best understood if we look at dietary restriction, because there it works as well. So in dietary restriction, there are low energy levels in the cells. This is sensed by an energy sensor, AMP kinase. AMP kinase will notice if AMP levels are high and ATP levels are low, and what it will do is it will activate catabolism. That would be the fire alarm. So we should leave? It's, uh, it's automatic the first day of the month, uh, so don't panic. Okay. But it's the second. It's, not it's the first. second day of the month. <laughs> but don't panic anyway. <laughs> At least you will die with an interesting story. <laughs> so. We have AMP kinase, it can sense these uh, low energy levels, it will activate catabolic reactions in the cell. So you see an e increase in TCA cycle and uh, fatty acid oxidation. This will generate NADH and FADH2 in these cycles, and these donate electrons to the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. Um, these electrons, they sort of um, enter these, this electron transport chain in complex 1 and complex 2. They migrate uh, through it. And all the while they are losing, uh, so a bit of energy is uh, passed on to pumping protons over this membrane. In the end, the electron is in a controlled reaction captured by oxygen and it forms water. All these protons are then uh, used for the proton motive force to generate ATP again. So what you will see in um, DR is this gets boosted because there's low energy levels. However, this process is not foolproof and some of these electrons leak away and if you boost it, more electrons will leak away and they will react in an uncontrolled fashion with oxygen and they will form these so-called reactive oxygen species. And we know in the hormetic response that um, these reactive oxygen species are needed for lifespan extension 
And in C. elegans and in some vertebrates as well, we know that there is a transcription factor, which in vertebrates is called MRF, and in C. elegans skin one is needed um, to have this lifespan extension. So, if metformin would uh, plug into this hormetic response, what you would expect to see is an increase in respiration, because this would be boosted, so you would uh, expect the organ organisms to respire more, an increase in peroxide production, so you would expect to see more ROS, an increase in catabolism, which we already saw in our uh, proteomic data, and the other thing you would expect to see is an increase in metabolic heat production. And the reason why I'm saying this is, this is not foolproof either, so some of the protons will just um, diffuse back into the membrane and their energy will be dissipated as heat. Um, is there something else? Ah, and what you would expect as well is, if you take away the ROS signal with antioxidants, you would not see the lifespan extension anymore, because then it would not depend on hormesis. So we tested all of that in our metformin-treated worms, and luckily the story fit. Uh, so, in the metformin treated worms, there's higher respiration, there's higher metabolic heat production, there's higher um, hydrogen peroxide levels, and what you can see is if we treat these worms not only with metformin, but with metformin and antioxidants, their lifespan extended effect is abolished, so you don't see it anymore. So, this made us think, um, or this sort of supported, uh, the fact that in C. elegans, metformin promotes lifespan through mitohormesis. We then looked a bit further into this hormetic response. Uh, one of the reasons why we did it is first, as I told you, we don't really know how metformin works. And the other thing is, we actually don't really know how these toxic species in the end activate a transcription factor that does beneficial things. And so this needs to be translated and some, something needs to clean up these toxic species and then bear that message uh, forward. So we looked into these two steps. The first step is where does metformin act, and there was some data in literature um, saying that it might inhibit complex 1. The problem is, this was discussed because if you would inhibit complex 1, you would actually expect that the electrons cannot be passed on anymore, and this would not be boosted, this entire process, and you would not get the increase in ROS. And indeed, if you use a complex 1 inhibitor called rotenol, it's a very potent complex 1 inhibitor, what you will see is that ROS production will actually go down, what you would expect for a complex 1 inhibitor. So what we did is, we looked at respiration in mitochondria that we exposed to metformin. So if the electrons are passed on, you will see respiration going up, and that's what you can see here. So it's a trace of oxygen consumption in the mitochondria of control worms in the black line and metformin-treated worms in the red line. And so this is where we added metformin to the metformin cell, it doesn't really matter. Pyruvate and malate and ADP are the substrates to get this reaction going. So if we feed pyruvate and malate, malate which is TCA cycle, so it will feed complex one. What you can see is in the control worms, uh, in the control met, um, mitochondria, the oxygen consumption goes on, so this is going through. And it does not happen in metformin-treated worms, so metformin does block complex one. What you can see here in the, is succinate, that's a complex 2 substrate, so if we feed the mitochondria with complex 2 substrate, it still works. So it's very specifically for complex 1 in the mitochondria. What we think is happening, I should say this as well, because uh, this ROS production still goes up, is that the electrons are actually donated, but they're blocked later on in this complex, which is why they can still leak away and it would actually improve the leaking away of the electrons because they cannot be passed on to the other complexes anymore. The other thing I told you about is how does this signal gets to be translated in something beneficial, and I should say something more because in C. elegans it's known what the upstream activator of uh, the skin one transcription factor is, and this is a kinase called PMK1. If it gets phosphorylated, then uh, skin one is activated. So to figure out how this ROS signal gets translated into something uh, good, we went back into our proteomics data set, and that was a bit of a lucky shot. Because we only had one antioxidant protein that was heavily differentially regulated. So we looked at this uh, protein, it's called uh, peroxyrodoxin 2. And there are several peroxyrodoxins, but this was the only one that was differentially regulated. So we looked at that one. What it does is it's a scavenger for ROS, so it will, it's um, highly abundant in the mitochondria. If ROS are produced, it will react with the ROS, it will form a dimer. And there was some data already in literature that these dimers could have signaling functions. 
So what we did is, it was upregulated, we did a Western blot, we could see that, so this would be the monomers. And on the Western blot as well, you can see more and more and more metformin treated worms, but then there's even more dimers in these metformin treated worms, so they are act actively cleaning these rods away and hopefully signaling. And so to show that, uh, no, let me first say this as well, so we also did a lifespan experiment with these worms, PRDX2 mutants are slightly shorter lived than wild types, which is to be expected. But if you give them metformin, the strain really collapses. They don't look good, they die very fast, and we think that is because of this hermetic response. Metformin is not beneficial to worms, it works via hormesis. And if you give it to them and they cannot react anymore, they will just have a toxic effect and they will die. Then the other thing is we wanted to close the gap and figure out whether PRDX2 is indeed the molecule that's also carrying the signal. And what we did is we uh, tested phosphorylation of PMK1 in these mutants. So in wild types, if you give metformin to these worms, this will get phosphorylated and the longevity effect will um, start. In the PRDX2 background, you do not see that anymore, so there's no activation of PMK1. Do I still have one minute more time to explain this? The only reason why I'm saying this is because I put healthy aging in my title and I've been talking about lifespan for now. So um, we also looked, we looked at these worms in more detail and the reason why we did it is any C. elegans person looking at these worms will tell you easily that they look incredibly healthy. They look good, they, they maintain their volume. So like humans, we shrink when we become older, the worms will shrivel up a bit and you do not see it in metformin treated worms. So this would be worm volume over uh, days of adulthood. These are the wild types, and you, so we didn't look further, we should have, but you will see it go down in older worms. And the metformin treated worms are far more resistant, so they look healthily. And if you look under the electron microscope, you will also see this is their skin, so their cuticle, that it gets stared up in older worms. Whereas the metformin-treated worms, they maintain a very um, in integral uh, cuticle. And in worms, the cuticle is extremely important in their health, so uh, this is probably why they look healthy as well. So, to end, you can read all of this. So, all these people contributed uh, to this work. It was not only Wout to me. This is a model we propose. We think these perox peroxide reductions are important uh, for metformin's mode of action. They're conserved in humans, so we're really waiting for someone to replicate this, at least in a vertebrate species. Um, there's some data out there on metformin treatment that looks promising, so I hope someone will really pick this up and look at this in vertebrates. And I just want to thank Wouter for, do, for doing nearly all of the work, Bertan Lillian, in whose labs um, all of this was done, and then a lot of people from this lab as well. If you have any questions, you can always send me an email or talk to me later on. And all this work was funded by um, our own government's grant. Thank you. Uh, are there questions? Uh, no questions? A quick question, more of a remind. What's the lifespan effect of metformin on mice? I think it's quite modest, right? 4%? You, you know this as well. Oh. Well, it varies between like 5% and 20%. So, they, so there, there are multiple studies. Well, uh, you know, in, in mice and rats. Mice. The 20% would be yes, the that, 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 study yes, they are, cancer. Yes. I mean normal mice. The, the normal, the, the black 6, I think they are like around 6%. That was in each of communications paper, that was around 6%. May, maybe a small remark on that as well. So. But this would be the direct effect of metformin. Metformin also has an impressively um, important effect on microbiotics. So depending on what would live in the intestines of these mice, the effect would change. It's the same for worms, it's the same uh, for humans probably as well, because not all diabetic patients are sensitive to metformin, and you will see differences there as well. And then the other thing as well that people have not really looked into yet, and that we sort of want to move into as well, is it has um, quite special metal binding properties and it probably does something in the ER with the metals and the redox state of the cells as well. But it's relatively new and it's something we need to go into. So, so th there's all these diverse things and this is one of the ways it is working and the total of effect would probably be a combination of all of these um, pleiotropic effects.
Uh, quick question. So, uh, um, can you maybe shed some more light on how metformin acts on complex one? So, are there any specific mechanisms? We don't know. This would be something that we would need to look into. We don't know by which mechanism it acts on complex one. That would need further study. Mm -hmm. Not all uh, studies also show that uh, complex one is inhibited. And uh, also interesting is that the other, uh, so bifurmin uh, and fenformin, if you feed them um, to mice, you see increases in blood lactate levels. And if you do it with metformin, you see almost nothing. Yes, and but then you see it in some patients <coughs> as well. So, yeah. I'm not really sure whether we can say well, what, what we can definitively say how that affects blood lactate levels. Okay, one one question and then we will okay, get lunch. Quickly, can I ask you if you consider taking metformin yourself? <laughs> and who in this room takes metformin except for me? <laughs> no, no, no. There's a few more in this room, I think, <laughs> and uh, you will probably not. I. So one of the reasons why I would not consider taking it is um, I work on worms so all the data well as we heard before worms are not humans and there are these side effects so it's something you should balance yourself whether you think the, the effects outweigh sort of the risks that you might be taking the other reason why I would not take it is um, because what we see here is this hormetic uh, mechanism you can also activate it via, via exercise, so you can just go jogging and you would have the same effect. And jogging has far nicer side effects than metformin has. <laughs> so I would recommend jogging. But I, I can imagine there's reasons why people think they want to take it. So I, I, I'm just very, I'm very cautious in, th there's all these things about metformin that we do not know and the prevalence of side effects is low, so you might want to take the risk. But um, they still are there. So. As you said, uh, worms are not humans, and one of the problems is that, for example, Pyaquat also extends lifespan in C. elegans. Mm -hmm. And clearly, I don't think it's very healthy. It's linked up to Parkinson's disease in humans. Uh, yes, I have thought to what extent that mitohormesis is really. Uh, you know, transferable to mammalian systems. Yes, but that and we have a lecture on hormesis, mm -hmm. so I don't know if uh, Sir Satan will speak about mitohormesis or only hormesis. Only general hormesis. Okay. So it's, it's the same with rotenone. If you give it in low doses to worms, it will, or anything, arsenic will work in low doses. It, it, radioactive irradiation will work in low doses in mice as well, in humans, by the way, as well. So, um, there's no really, so how this really works and what the doses matter is the nice thing about metformin is that if you give it at a dose that fully blocks the electron transport chain, it works, whereas for all these other compounds it would not. So that there is a bit of difference in, and that's why the question on how it actually acts on these mitochondria <laughs> is a really interesting question because it seems to behave different from several other compounds.